a filled passage. And so, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> wow, what a, what a deep one, right? This is some heavy stuff here. This angel announces that uh, if you've received the mark of the beast uh, in this time, it's like the final nail in the coffin. Now, chapter 13, remember, is when we were introduced to this, this guy, the beast, or this uh, world leader that's, that's planned to come. He's the phony Messiah. He's going to claim to be Jesus and is not. And then um, when he has full power and full command of, of the world system, the Bible says he will cause everyone, everyone to make a, a, a small or great to have a mark in their hand or in their forehead that they won't be able to buy, sell, or trade without it. If you've got your, your Bible still open, look back at chapter 13, verse, verse number 7. Remember, he's <clears throat> said he's given to make war with the saints, to overcome them, power over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. And in verse, thir- verse number 10, it says that um, here is the patience and the faith of the saints. And so in chapter 13, it's like patience, and here's, here's your uh, faith, saints, because it's not going to be good if someone is on the earth against this guy. Uh, there, there's not going to be a, uh, a court to... Um, uh, to bring up a, um, a, oh, what's the word I'm looking for when you, when you lose a case and then you want to uh, take it to the next court? You appeal. There's nowhere to appeal to. <clears throat> he has control of everything, and, and if, they, if someone doesn't submit to this uh, beast uh, w- antichrist system, they're not going to be able to buy, sell, or trade, and, and uh, I think that there are going to be a lot of people being killed uh, who do not worship the image. But in our chapter today, it says that those that take the mark, it shows you what's going to happen to them. That they will drink of the, of the wrath of God without any mixture and the fire and brimstone. All these, these uh, um, you've heard of fire and brimstone preachers. I'm not going to yell snot and spit and snort, but I'm telling you, this is the, the picture that the Bible gives for those that uh, choose um, this, this system and worship uh, the false god. <clears throat> now, I, I want to, first of all, just bring it to your mind here, the seriousness of this. And if you know the Lord is your Savior in here, uh, and you've already accepted Christ, do you realize that you once were lost before you were saved? You know, say amen to that. We, we all had a time when we were lost, and we were going the wrong way, or, or not even aware of, of God and, and Jesus. And, and there was room to turn, or there was space to repent, or uh, a realization, wow, I, I didn't know I needed Jesus, and I, hey, I'm glad I found him, because whoo, I wasn't, that, that was a bad deal if I'd have kept going that direction. This chapter, there's no U-turn. There's no, well, I made a mistake, I took that mark, I, I worshiped the beast, and now I'm having second thoughts. That, that doesn't happen here. In, in chapter 14, because of where we're at in time, uh, we believe, this. if you're looking at the, the timeline, here's the cross, and, and we're in the year 2022, and sometime after today, or, uh, we've still got a few hours, it might happen, but the Bible says that the trump's going to sound, the dead in Christ will rise, and, and we'll meet the Lord in the air, and the church will leave and go meet the Lord, and there'll be seven years where it kind of goes back to a mixture of Old Testament time, but yet we still have the knowledge of Jesus, and, and then this Antichrist guy is going to be revealed sometime three and a half years <coughs> into that seven-year period. So it, it's not the way it is today. The way it is today, we talk about being the age of grace, where God's long-suffering. He's reaching out, knocking on the, the door of your heart, saying, hey, I, I love you. I want you to come to to receive uh, the Lord Jesus as your payment for sin. As uh, Dwight said, salvation without probation. Uh, make that decision. And if you're wearing a Steelers sweatshirt in the lobby, you can get saved that same day. Amen, right? That we, it can happen in a moment. But in this time frame, for those that would say, you know, I, I do want to believe in the Lord Jesus. I'm not taking that mark. I'm not going with the world system. It's, it, there's no middle ground. Your faith will have to have works or your life will line up with the Antichrist and then this is the result. So I'm saying you, not by pointing the finger, I'm just saying it in general for someone who does not 
um, who would not know the Lord yet and be living that time. So watch just the, the, how it's different now and, and notice the, the seriousness of, of the situation then and what blessings that you can tell someone, share with someone, or if you're not sure yet today, you still have an opportunity uh, to turn. So go back with me. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Go backwards. You want to hold your spot. We'll come back to this Revelation part. Ephesians chapter 2. We've been in the Sunday school uh, in these, these verses, but look at verse number 1. And notice uh, the difference between this time in Revelation 14 and times past, where we are now and even before uh, Jesus died on the cross, just to give you a, a couple of thoughts here. Ephesians 2, verse 1. It says, And you had thee quickened, made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Meaning that we had the, the penalty of, of the second death was on us. Verse 2. Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation or behavior in times past, the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. And so it gives this time frame that in times past, we were children of wrath, the wrath of God. Like Revelation 14 says, hey, they take the mark, they're going to drink of the wrath of God. Now, I didn't plan it out this way, but Sunday we preached on the wrath of God, and then I opened the book, and I'm like, well, here we go again. Somebody needs to hear about the wrath of God. That's what I figured out. Maybe it's me, but uh, <clears throat> Sunday we talked about some things that in the Scripture that, that uh, rose, raised the wrath of God, and in our chapter tonight, it shows that if they take the mark, they're going to get the wrath of God. Well, our life in times past, we were in that setting, but we got to get out of that, that direction. We got to get out of that sentence. And that's the difference of the time that we're living in right now as compared to after Jesus uh, calls the church out. Things are serious in Revelation 14. If you, if you took the mark of the beast in your hand or in your forehead, that's it. There's no turning back from that. Um, Ephesians 2. Go to Galatians chapter 1. If you're Flipping pages, we're flipping the, right, the same direction, okay? Galatians chapter 1, verse 23. The fellow who was used to write most of the New Testament, uh, Saul of Tarsus, his name was changed to Paul. Verse 23, they're talking about him, and it says, But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed. And they glorified God in me. See, Paul had a past. In times past, he was persecuting the church. And they said, now he's preaching for the church. Uh, when Dwight was talking to that fella uh, there Monday, it was neat because uh, he said, man, I'm 30 years old now. I got four kids. And man, my life's totally changed And uh, from when Dwight knew him as a teenager and, and the direction he was going. And, you know, isn't that wonderful that people's lives can still change. That's one thing I hope that I will always believe instead of just perceive. Because I've caught myself many times. Um, I've been in, around Marysville for 15 years now, and certain names come up, and I'm like, oh yeah, that's a bad one. Uh, been bad a long time, nothing but trouble, oh, watch out. And I think, yeah, but they could still change at any moment. Y'all say amen to that? It can still happen. The Bengals could still win a Super Bowl. It could happen. The Browns never will. Never will. But, uh, you know, th things can change. Even though there might be a pattern before, when someone gets the, the Lord in their life or has, has that realization um, and, 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 and turns to Him, things can change. And I, I'm reminded, uh, I, I was... I was uh, uh, rebuked by a church member years ago, and I was talking, that, and I said, man, that person, they are just, oh, it's just all the time, nothing's ever changing there, and they said, preacher, you said people can always change. I'm like, thank you for reminding me, 
Thank you for rebuking me. I, uh, sometimes in reality, we, it just seems like there's no light at the end of the tunnel, but people's lives can change. And so in, times past, in this time that we're living in, it's not, you could have worshipped the devil and followed his, his uh, plan, and you're not doomed because you made that decision. In Revelation 14, you take the mark, it's doomed. That's the seriousness of it. We still live in a time where you can have a time's past and have a different uh, uh, conclusion. Go with, with me to Acts chapter 14. This town, <coughs> they wanted to make Paul and Barnabas like uh, gods because they seen a miracle took place. And uh, verse number uh, 14 of chap- uh, Acts 14, 14, it says, Which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, that they were running after them and throwing sacrifices for them and, and calling them Jupiter and... and uh, uh, Mer- Mer- uh, Mercurius, they, they, act, they, they were acting like these guys were uh, gods that came down. When Paul heard of it, he rent his clothes and ran in among the people, crying out. Verse 15, he said, Sirs, why do you these things? We also are men of like passions with you, and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities. Don't, don't worship other gods, and don't try to make people to be gods. Turn from these unto the living God which made heaven and earth, the sea, and all the things that are therein. And then this is interesting. Look at verse 16. Who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left them not himself without witness, and that he did good. He gave us rain from heaven, fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, scarce restrained they the people that they had not done sacrifice Unto them, it says here in times past, God allowed nations to walk after their uh, their own ways, but He got, left them a witness. But now that Jesus has come, there's no winking, there's no ignorance, there's no um, other option for nations now that Jesus has come. Because in Acts 17, it says. Now that he rose from the dead and is, and is uh, the assurance of God for all people, everyone, he commands everyone to repent at the name of Jesus. When Christ came, he changed the calendar from, from B.C. to A.D. He changed the religion from Hebrew to Christian. He, he changed the, uh, uh, the payment for sin from sacrifices of animals to now the sacrifice of himself as the Lamb of God. It changed everything. And in God's uh, economy, when Jesus came now, he commands everyone to repent and he'll, salvation will be shown to all men in some way from God. Before that, Acts 17 says, God winked at their ignorance at a time until the Jesus would come. He left a witness. He was good. He sent rain and creation. You could see there's a God. But now that Jesus is here, everything's changed. We now have no excuse for not turning to Him. Uh, what, what do we do with the Lord Jesus, with, that He died on the cross and rose from the dead? Either He did or He didn't, and if He did, I, I need to make peace with the sacrifice that God gave for me. So there's this, this time frame of times past. In, in our verse, go back to Revelation, it says that the wrath of God if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark and his forehead, the, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Now, some verses in Revelation, I am glad that they don't apply to me. Can you all say amen to that? I, I'm thankful when you talk about the lake of fire, the second death, the, the mark and <clears throat> these things. I'm, I'm like, that ain't for me. Thank the Lord that I don't have to worry about this verse. So do we just skip it and throw a, and cut it out the page and since we make a little paper airplane out of it and not worry about it? No, there's some, there's some learning for us, but it's not applicable to us. Now let me explain why you should not be worried about this wrath of God. Okay, This wrath of God is when they've chosen the false god, they've rejected Jesus, and, and it's already past the time when the church is left. Go with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And I'm taking it for granted 
because we've talked about the church being raptured before um, the tribulation begins. We, it seemed like we talked for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks on end. That's the most common question I get when we start to teach prophecy or revelation, is people say, Preacher, what about the church? When do we leave? Do we have to go through it? And I have all kinds of questions about that. <clears throat> and there's tons of proofs. And, and um, now we have videos on YouTube. You can go back and watch it. Amen, right? But the biggest reason is that, that the seven-year tribulation is for Israel and we're the church. But look at 1 Thessalonians 5. And just another proof of this, talking about the wrath of God and, and these folks that are going to face it. 1 Thessalonians 5, look at verse 1. Me. But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. When they shall say, Peace and safety, sudden destruction shall come upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. <clears throat> but ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye, ye are children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of the darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. <clears throat> For they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that be drunken, drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith, love, for a helmet, the hope of salvation. And so there, definitely you see the difference of the groups. One's darkness, one's light. One's night, one's day. One is hoping in salvation and uh, has faith and love, and the other ones are drunken in the night and, and not sober and not even asleep to it, not even aware of what's going on. Verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to what? Wrath. To wrath. So there's no way I'm in chapter 14. If you're a child of the king, you are changed from darkness to light, you've been saved. It says, we're not appointed to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. And that waking and sleeping is the previous chapter, how it says those that are asleep in Christ will God bring with them and will raise up when the last trumpet sounds. So for a Christian, the Bible says we're not appointed unto wrath. I'm not worried about Revelation 14. I'm not worried about the beast. I'm not worried about uh, the uh, mark. I'm not worried about those things because I'm not appointed that. I won't be here to face it. You follow me? So just first thing, I want to get that out of the way, is Revelation 14, there's wrath of God there. But if you're a Christian, you're saying, "Woo, that one's already, uh, not, not have to worry about that one. Uh, uh, we're good to go on, on, in that setting. And so um, now let me talk just a little bit about this wrath of God. What causes the wrath of God? We looked at some of it Sunday, but let me just give you a few other examples and even though we're not going to face it in Revelation, um, there are some examples of God's people facing God's anger. And I, I mentioned Sunday, uh, I, I can seem to get angry with people that I love more than I get angry with people that I don't even know. I don't know if you have that same situation. Um, Elliot came up today out, outside and he, he was about in tears, his little football had a big old bite out of the, the corner of it. He just got this new football. He's so happy, so excited. And uh, he came up and said, Dad, Judson ate it. <laughs> and I'm like, Judson? And he's like, did, 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 did Elliot win? I, and he, <laughs> ate his, he, chewed his, uh, he chewed his football up. I'm like, Judson, why would you do that? And, and Judson, uh, he's, he's giving me his four-year-old uh, explanation. I'm like, you, you just ruined this. Oh. I love my kids, but somebody else's kid, I'd be like, eh, I shouldn't let him eat it. I'd laugh it off, you know, but <laughs> Judson, I'm like, Judson, oh, uh, we, we can get angrier at people that we know, y'all say amen, than strangers that we like, well, I, you know, I don't know them, maybe they had a bad day, I don't know what their deal is, but somebody, that, somebody of your relationship with, you, you find, I could find myself 
at least my wife can get angry at me. Can somebody say amen, right? I, I'm like, whoa, I thought you, we're married. Like, yeah, I know we're married, and I'm about to. Uh, <clears throat> so what, what I'm saying, if you've got a relationship with the Lord, well, God loves me. Yeah, and God loves you so much that I think he expects some things from us. I think he's deserving of some respect since we're his kids. I think that, that uh, there ought to be just some um, un, even unspoken or unsaid things that, hey, if he's my father, I need to treat him better than uh, others who I don't have any relationship with. And so in the Old Testament, here's some examples of what caused the wrath of God. And just saying, I know we're not going to drink that cup in Revelation 14, but let's look at it together. Exodus 32, okay? Old Testament, Exodus Chapter number 32. Moses was up on the mount getting the Ten Commandments. While he's up there, Aaron was down there making a golden calf. Remember the story? I love Aaron's uh, explanation. Moses, what did you do? I don't know. We just threw the golden fire and out came a calf. It sounds like Judson's explanation, amen, right? The, the football just you know, ate it, you know, it just happened. Uh, Exodus chapter 32, look at verse number 10. The Lord was telling Moses, now let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them and that I may consume them, Exodus 32, 10, and I will make of thee a great nation. And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? And Moses began to intercede for them. And then the next, the next story, Moses is like, Lord, why did you give me these people? Just get them out of here. So you like see the, the conversation between the Lord and Moses go back and forth. Moses is interceding for the people here. And the next one, the Lord's like, it's okay, Moses, you're going to get through it, and kind of comforts him because he's fed up with the people. In the next, the next story, in this passage, the Lord's anger is because they were worshiping false gods. I mean, he's just up there for a little bit, and they're like, hey, Aaron, uh, Moses is gone. We don't know where the God is that just split the Red Sea, <clears throat> just walked us across dry land. We don't know what happened to that God, so here's our gold." Make us, a, make us a, an idol. How quick are people to forget the God that did something for them, saved them from hell, uh, showed up in a mighty way, and then all of a sudden we just, okay, where's the next thing to adore? Where's the next thing to go after? And we just forget, and it made the Lord angry. To worship other gods, it's, one, it's the first of the Ten Commandments. For thou shalt have no other gods, before me, it brought the wrath of God down upon the people when he saw that they were worshiping an, an, a false god. Uh, well, preacher, I'm not going to make any statues and bow down to them. Well, I don't know if we have to make it, but we can find ourselves submitting our lives to a lot of other things besides the true God. <clears throat> it just happens. I'm not trying to make you feel horrible, but I am trying to make you look in the mirror and realize, what do I spend my time with? What do I give my attention and my worship to? What takes up the, the majority of my mind and my, my energy? Is it uh, something that the Bible says, what would it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul? You gain the whole world and you're not going to live forever down here. So th there's that realization of, man, I, I need to think of eternity. I need to think of, well, if I'm thinking of eternity, I need to think of Jesus. Well, I'm thinking of Jesus. I need to think about worshiping, serving, praising, and those things. And so they worship false gods. Go to Numbers chapter 11. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, just a few pages over. I'll show you another thing that made the wrath of God show up. Remind me never to eat Cheeto Paul crunches before I come preach, okay? So my kids had them out, and I was, I was chowing down on them. Now I got... Cheetos go crunch in my throat all night here. Numbers chapter 11, verse number 1. And when the people, what's the next word? Complained. 
It displeased the Lord. The Lord heard it. His anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. They were complaining about the bread God was providing and uh, the path that he had led them on. They've forgotten that they were being beaten and killed as slaves in Egypt, and now they're complaining about just magical bread showing up every morning that they get to eat. In verse number 10, Moses heard the people weep throughout their families, every man in the door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly, and Moses also was displeased. And Moses said, Lord, wherefore hast thou afflicted me, thy servant? Wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight that thou layest the burden of all these people upon me? And they're complaining and whining and crying, and they want to go back to Egypt. They're missing the leeks and the garlic and, and uh, the onions in verse 5 and the fish that they ate, and they're, they're complaining about what God has provided for them. I've been, been uh, uh, putting together some thoughts for a, a sermon, and I'm not going to preach it all right now, but you know, when... When we're uh, trusting the Lord, if you've given your life to the Lord and you said, God, I'm yours, you saved me, you direct my paths. How dare I begin to complain over whatever path he puts me on? I mean, can you imagine a guy going to Columbus trying to take a guy to a bus stop and missing the bus by five minutes and just wanting to complain? Can you imagine him going to the next bus stop and getting there and the app won't work and uh, <clears throat> trying to get the guy on the bus and then the ticket can't be bought and just maybe him wanting to complain a little bit. And then that same guy has to drive to Dayton, but on the way realizes that we've got to get something to eat because we haven't had lunch. And then he better talk to the guy about the Lord and then the fellow gets saved. And I'm like, how dare I almost start to complain about driving from Columbus to Springfield to Dayton. And I thought, this was just direction of the Lord. He just, he had something worked out. Um, my, my day, uh, Monday, I was going to uh, uh, help a fellow that j just needed some assistance. And, and uh, I, I told him that I'd help him and uh, try to be with us his case. And so I didn't get there Monday because I was driving from Columbus to Springfield to Dayton. And Tuesday, I, I went to the, the police station here in Marysville and was going to try to help this guy. And right when I went in, the lady said, well, they're talking about his case right now. So why don't you wait a second? And the fellow's guardian came out and said, preacher, I know you want to help this guy, but I think we need to just do something different. I said, well, I'm glad you're here because, you know, I'd have been here yesterday and fouled it all up. So thank the Lord I, you were here right when I came. That's pretty ironic. And, and so I pull out to get ready to go home and she calls me back and she says, can you come back in here? The judge wants to talk to you. And I'm like, okay. So I, my day goes from uh, being the wrong place, wrong time and, and coming back. And now I'm the star witness of the case. And I, I didn't even know what was going on. The judge is like, thank you so much for helping this guy. And, you know, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And I thought, Wow, I, I have no control of my life right now. I, I, I'm just hopefully where God wants me to be, and I'm just going to uh, see how it, it turns out and, and how things work out. Listen, if I'm going to complain about what happens in my life, what I'm really saying is, God, why did you direct my path this way? Why did you do that to me? And God said, just trust me. I'm trying to do something good for you. Boy, the complaining about what our path is, it made the Lord angry. It angered him. Well, preacher, sometimes it's frustrating. I'll say amen to that. I get that. But if you're really trying to trust the Lord with your life, should we be complaining about the details that our, our life gets to? I, I don't know. I, I think that that's a, a very self-centered a way to live that it, you're only pleased if it goes your way. That sounds like a three or four year old, don't it? They're, they're happy when they get what they want. And if not, they're going to bite the end of your football off. <laughs> As adults, we can find ourselves complaining when we should be just trusting that, hey, I've given God the, the right to direct my life. I'm trying to trust him. And so now I'm just going to wait and see what he does. And I'm going to give thanks 
and give thanks all the way through it. So they complained. It made the anger of the Lord come up. Go to 2 Chronicles chapter 24. Just a couple more of these, and then I'll give you some anecdotes. What if God's angry with me? What do I do then, preacher? Well, in Revelation 14, there ain't nothing you can do. It's over. You're that wrath of God, there's no anecdote. If they take the mark, done. Toast. Literally, burnt. Okay, <laughs> it's it. Look at 2 Chronicles 24. says in verse number 17, Now, after the death of Jehoiada came the princes of Judah, 2 Chronicles 24, 17, and they made obeisance to the king, and then the king hearkened unto them. And they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers and served groves and idols, and wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for their trespass. Well, similar to Exodus, they had false idols and, and false gods. But notice what, what prefaced or what was before them finding other gods. It says they left the house of the Lord God. And I, I know that it can be a touchy subject, but listen, if we claim Jesus as our Savior, there probably ought to be, oh, thank you, thanks, Cole, <clears throat> there probably ought to be some time that we spend in the house of the Lord. My kids say, hey, when are we going to go see Grandma and Grandpa? When are we going to go see Grandma and Grandpa? When are we going to go see this person? <clears throat> they want to be around the people that they know and they love. I was excited, Judson, today. I got home because uh, at a parent-teacher conference, so Courtney was, was doing with the kids, and Judson said, time for church? I go church. Yeah, we're going to go. I go now. He wanted to go to church now. He had, he had a buddy he was going to see tonight night at church. So he wanted to go as soon as we get there. I'm like, well, I'm glad you're excited to go. I didn't know you were going to bite the football when you get there, but, you know, I'm glad you're excited to go. <clears throat> and, and he wanted to go. The Bible says, I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. Uh, sometimes there's some duty to it. Sometimes there's just some obedience through it and some responsibility with it. But, friend, the wrath of God came up when they left the house of God. Of all the houses we can go to in this life, I hope that I won't leave the Lord's house unattended. In 2 Chronicles 24, it says they left the house of God. Look at uh, 2 Chronicles 30, verse 8. It's another um, ingredient of what brought the wrath of God in these places. 2 Chronicles chapter 30. The accusation for Jerusalem was to not be like their fathers, in verse 7, which trespassed against the Lord God, uh, 2 Chronicles 37, 30 verse 7, who therefore gave them up to desolation. Now be ye not stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves unto the Lord and enter into His sanctuary. Go in there which he hath sanctified forever, and serve the Lord your God, that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. What do you do if you feel like the wrath of God's on you? They said, hey, get in the sanctuary. Go seek him. Go try to uh, uh, present yourself in front of him. Uh, whenever there's been an issue with me and some other person, or I've had an issue between myself, if, if I would go to them or if they would go to me, even if I didn't like what was going on, I always respected the fact that somebody came to talk to me about it. Or I went and said, hey, we could try to figure this out. When you just go there, well, I don't, I don't like confrontation. Yeah, but when you avoid it, it just gets worse. It, it just boils over. If you go and say, look, man, we, we just, I want to try to make things right. What are they going to do? I, I want to stay wrong with you? <laughs> it, it, it breaks the ice, and maybe that's just what needs to happen to... Um, uh, get, get things out in the open. When with the wrath of God you feel like is on you, I'm going to go to a sanctuary. I'm going to go into his house. Hey, here I am, Lord. I, I, I'm wrong. I, I've, been, I've been away from you, but here I am. I want to I present myself in front of you. And uh, later on in that same chapter, just give some more um, instances that when they finally did that and when they finally came and they, 
uh, Hezekiah changed all the scenario and, and brought the, the nation back to serve in the Lord. Then they got joy again at the end of chapter 30. And then the, uh, the, they were healed in, the, in chapter 30, verse 20. So <clears throat> some of the anecdote to the wrath of God is just going to that source where you think He's mad at you. Uh, God's great mercy, long-suffering, tender-hearted, kind, forgiving. And though His wrath may be warranted, I don't think He ever is angry with no reason. If we would come to Him, it would change the whole scenario. Uh, just a couple more. Look at uh, Nehemiah chapter 13, and I'm watching the time. Nehemiah chapter 13. What causes the wrath of God? Nehemiah chapter 13. Verse number 15. In those days saw I in Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath, bringing in sheaves and lading their asses, as also wine, grapes, and figs, all manner of burdens which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I testified against them. <clears throat> the day wherein they sold victuals. There dwelt men of Tyre also therein, which brought fish and all manner of ware, and sold on the Sabbath unto the children of Judah and Jerusalem. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said unto them, what evil thing is this that you do and profane the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers thus, and did not our God bring all this evil upon us and upon this city? Yet ye bring more wrath upon Israel by profaning the Sabbath. <clears throat> Let me give you the scenario. Nehemiah went to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls because Babylon in 606 B.C. destroyed Jerusalem. God allowed an enemy country to wipe their city off the map. They destroyed the temple. They took all their holy things. Everything that was of importance to Israel was gone. And now, a few hundred years later, God allowed a band of Jews that were commissioned by the new government, the Medes and Persians, to go build up this t the temple. And Nehemiah, he said, man, we got the temple, but there's no wall around it. This, anybody can go in there and break in now. We got it rebuilt, but with nothing to protect it. And they let Nehemiah go back and rebuild the wall. And then he sees this and he's like, guys, what are we doing? We're doing the same thing that caused our city to be destroyed hundreds of years before. We're profaning the Sabbath day. We're acting like it's just the same as anything else. But we've got a God who set apart the Sabbath day <clears throat> for us to remember it and keep it holy. Now, we're in the New Testament. Jesus died. I believe we set aside the Lord's Day as a day of rest and as a day to worship. But I'm telling you, believers, especially believers, the world, they're lost. They don't know what to do. But you believe in the Lord Jesus, man, there ought to be a difference between the Lord's Day and every other day that we get to do whatever we want with. Amen. Amen. I know I'm preaching. You guys are here on Wednesday night. Preacher, hey, we're, this isn't even the Lord's Day. We're in the house. Give us a break. Oh, our carnal mind wants to get ahead, wants to take advantage of, well, if I can, I can do, just set aside the day for your, your rest, your good, your family, the Lord's family. Give it a rest. Give it a break. You'll accomplish way more in six if you give him the one. I'm telling you. Uh, my dad's a farmer, farmed a thousand acres, 1,200 uh, uh, times when I was a kid, and worked uh, full-time at the electric company, worked third shift climbing poles and, and a trouble man. And when the storm hit, you know, all that stuff. And I'm telling you, on Sunday, there was always some way to get ahead on the farm, 1,200 acres and, and working full-time. And every time we did, it broke down, it let down, it was horrible. And he said, I'm done. We're not doing it anymore. He used to even let other guys drive his tractors on Sunday, and then they would break down. Remember, a guy was driving with a disc, and all of a sudden, he was pulling the whole fence with a disc right down the field. And Dad's like, what are you doing? I'm like, Sunday, Dad. And that's what he's doing. Mm -hmm, that's what happened. It, just, it, it was comical because my dad, he, he's like, I don't, you know, I don't get ahead. There's no way to get ahead going against God's ways. Now, if your ox is in the ditch, you get it out of the ditch. Amen? You can do good on the Lord's Day. I'm not telling you to uh, not do good with it. But if you believe, man, 
There's something there. It made the Lord angry. He said, you're going to bring more wrath because, look, he's let us come back and fix it. Now we're doing it all over again. It caused the wrath of God. And then one more, Ezekiel 22. I did this one for Ted Murphy. If you know Brother Ted, uh, he's the mayor of North Lewisburg now, so we, we've got royalty and, and uh, politicians in our, in our midst. I went to his inauguration uh, <laughs> at, the, at the city of North Lewisburg, and I told him we were going to storm the Capitol if they didn't make him mayor, okay? We were teasing with him, but uh, Ezekiel chapter uh, 22, and this is his favorite verse in the Bible. And so when we turned there, I had to make a little shout out to Ted and, and pray for Ted. He's asked that, that we'd pray for him and that he would be a, a good witness and, and do good for his city and, and town, those things. But uh, we were just having some fun teasing him a little bit. But Exodus, or, uh, Ezekiel 22, look at verse 30. This is in the midst of a bunch of accusations against Israel. Again, this is right around the time that they've lost their kingdom the first time with Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 30, it says this, God said, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Therefore have I poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord God. Here, here's the last thought I want to give you. The wrath of God, we don't have to worry about it in Revelation 14. It's not for us. It's for those that take the mark. But that's what chapter we're in. That's what we're looking at. But this verse, this chapter says that God sought for just one man who would stand in the gap and live differently. Just one man. I don't know if you've ever had this temptation of a thought to say, what difference am I going to make in America? I'm one life. I'm just one person. I can't change America, so what what I even worry about it? Or maybe you say, I'm just one person in Ohio. What what change could I make for Ohio? Or maybe you've said, I'm just one person in Marysville. You know, what what what's my voice or what's my life gonna change something? Or maybe you said, I'm just one person at my work. W- what am I gonna do? How, how how is my testimony gonna change things that or maybe you've said, I'm just one person in my family. I mean, what's, what good's it going to do if I get right because the rest of my family is not interested in? You can have that thought at any level of your life. But can I tell you this? God might just be searching just for one person to make the difference. And he can avoid all the judgment that he was going to give because one person says, God, I'm going to live for you. I don't care what anyone else says. I don't care what anyone else does. I'm going to be I'm going to be that person that stands in the gap and I'm going to live differently. I'm going to try to honor you and obey you and I will be I, what 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 difference can one person make for a, a family, for a community, for a, 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 pl- a place of employment, for a school? Who knows? Because God, he would have avoided the judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah if he had just found a few righteous. And here he would it says I sought for one that I wouldn't have poured the indignation upon Israel. Just one guy that would stand up and live differently and stand in the gap. Boy, I hope that we'll have at least one. I hope we'll have more than one. I hope that we'll have a bunch of people say, you know what? I'm going to live differently. It doesn't matter what people are doing around me. I'm going to be that person that just stands in the gap. Well, not, no one else is doing it. So, maybe they will when they see you. Maybe you'll be the spark plug that ignites the fire. Maybe you'll be the match that sets, well, we're not going to set no, Smokey the Bear. Never mind, that's the wrong, wrong thought here. But uh, maybe you'll be, maybe you'll be that, that one spiritual flame that starts a revival all around you in your family and in your community and in whatever area you're at. He just sought for one so his wrath wouldn't come. Well, I hope that we can uh, be uh, salt and be some preservation for Marysville, for Ohio, for America. Hey, let, let's be righteous. Let's do something so God can hold back some of the judgment and some of that wrath until it has to be revealed in Revelation. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Lord, thank you for tonight. Thank you for your word. We open and just try to learn and study some things from it. And God, I thank you for your mercy. 
Lord, it's a blessing that I'm not appointed unto wrath as a child of the king and uh, in Thessalonians. And so um, we think about these different things of leaving the house of God and worshiping other gods and, and complaining and profaning and the, sab- the Sabbath. And Lord, uh, just help us to not be tempted to throw in the towel because we don't think we can make a difference. Or just one, making a difference, as the book of Jude says, pulling just one out of the fire. We love you tonight, God. I I thank you for those that are hearing and listening. And um, we'll stand and sing a hymn of invitation in a minute and just give the opportunity if anyone needs to come and wants to come. Oh, you feel free and feel welcome. Hey, you be that person. You be that one that stands in the gap. I don't know if I'm making a difference. It's not for you to know. You just do it and let God work through it. Let him uh, be what changes the scenario uh, for the situation you're in. Lord, we love you tonight. We ask that you meet with us. And God, I pray that, uh, Lord, you just um, have your will in your way. Uh, Lord, that there's uh, uh, something that needs to be accomplished, that you would do it. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, uh,